And uh, we're going to look at that verse, first of all, in Isaiah 64. And then we're going to turn back to this passage, 1 Corinthians 2, and we'll explore the way that the Apostle Paul uses the verse here. And uh, let me remind you that we are doing this as part of our series on vision. The need for us all to have vision, because without vision, we are left to ourselves. Remember that verse? Without a vision, the people perish. And so we've spent these past weeks now setting a number of visions uh, for us all to consider. Visions of God. Uh, we've had visions of the Lord Jesus Christ. We had that very difficult morning, do you remember, when we had the vision of a lost soul? And uh, we asked the question, what value do we place on our own souls? What value do we place on the souls of others? Those in our family, those we work with, those we live next door to, what value is there for a soul? So vision then, we are thinking about vision. And uh, this morning then, if you want a title, the title is a vision of what the eye cannot see. So look back to our text, first of all, in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, eye has not seen. And then of course the thought continues, ear has not heard nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So here's the idea then. We're going to set for us this morning a vision of what our eyes can't see, a vision of what our ears can't hear, a vision of what has not entered into the heart of man. You may think that's a challenge, but as I thought about this now over a number of weeks, it seems to me to be a really important vision for us all, especially at this time, uh, for us to all, all capture and to hold on to. So it's a vision of what the eye cannot see. Let's ask God to help us then as we turn to his word. Lord, we thank you that we are here this morning in this building, that we're in our homes joining by Zoom if we can, that on this first day of the week, we are worshipping you, our God, the God who is from everlasting to everlasting, an infinite God, unsearchable in your being, your wisdom, your love, your power, your compassion, your greatness, your mercy, your goodness to us, your people. We thank you for one another. We thank you, our God, that we are able to worship in this way, and we commend ourselves as we may be sitting here uh, on these hard pews, as we may be sitting at home where things are more comfortable. We commend ourselves to you, and we ask your blessing upon us. Lord, we are your people. We've just read that we are the clay, and you, our God, are the potter. So make us, mould us, shape us in your own image, by your word, as we look together uh, into it, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I want to begin then by asking you to do something. What I want you to do is bring to mind something that you are asking God to do. Something that you may have been asking God to do for some time. So I'm going to assume that you are able to do that, okay? Bring to mind something that you've been asking God to do. And uh, some of you may say to me, well, Neil, I'm not asking God to do anything. And if that's the case, I'd say to you, why not? You're asking God to do something. Perhaps you're asking God to do something for yourself. You may be asking God to do something for someone else, maybe somebody in your family. Alternatively, you may be asking God to do something for the church, for our congregation, for the church generally, the church that is very weak at the moment. You may be asking God for the church. Or maybe, just maybe, you're asking God to do something about the world in which we live. 
this world that's in the grip of a pandemic, this Western world that's abandoned Christianity, this world where suffering continues as it always has, perhaps you're asking God to do something for the world. Now, what is it that you're asking God to do? Now, as you keep that in mind, and I want you to keep it in mind throughout this morning, what you're asking God to do, we are going to turn, first of all, to Isaiah 64. And we're going to see there that the prophet is asking God to do something. And it may be that you've been asking God to do this for a very long time. And if you have been asking God to do this thing for a very long time, and there's no evidence yet that he's answering you, perhaps you feel discouraged. Perhaps you've given up expecting God to do this thing. Perhaps you no longer look for it because it's been such a long time. Well, firstly, let's turn to Isaiah 64. Let's see what the prophet is asking. And let's see what we can learn from him. So don't forget now, keep in mind all morning what it is you're asking God to do. So we turn back to Isaiah 64. And uh, once you find Isaiah 64, look at the very first verse. And there is what the prophet is asking God to do. So look at the verse, all oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence. That's the request of the prophet. He's asking God to tear open the heavens and to make himself known. Now this phrase, rend the heavens, it's one that's got a, a link to our church because it's a, a phrase that was used by one of my predecessors uh, during the time of the last Welsh revival, that God would rend the heavens. So what the prophet is asking God to do is to make his power, his might, his presence, his glory, his majesty, to make it clear for everyone to be aware of the greatness and the glory of God. He's asking God to do this for the sake of God's people, but also because they're surrounded by their enemies. So when the prophet says to God, oh, that you would rend the heavens, it's a very low point in the life of God's people. And as you read that chapter, you get the sense of how low things are. The cities have been abandoned. The temple is burned. And so here's the prophet turning to God and he's saying, God, why don't you do something about the situation we're in? Look at how bad it is. Why don't you act? Why don't you show us how great you are and how powerful you are? That's what the prophet is asking God to do. Now, I want you to notice as you go through Isaiah 64, what the prophet then does from verses five to seven is he gives God reasons why he shouldn't do what he's asking him. So take a look at verses five to seven. And uh, you can sum up in one word what, God, uh, what the prophet is saying. He's saying to God that you don't need to do what I'm asking because of our sin. And so the prophet lays out the sin of the people, and he says to God, perhaps it's because of our sin that you aren't answering us, that you're not doing this thing that I think you need to do. And so take a look at those verses, and they're very powerful verses, aren't they? Look at verse 6. We all like an unclean thing. Uh, all our righteousness are like filthy rags. That's a very famous statement. We all fade as a leaf. We all sin. And so here's the prophet trying to understand why God isn't doing what he's asking him. And so he comes up with this reason. It, it, it may be because we've sinned. Now, do you think any of you 
that the reason why God isn't doing that thing you're asking him to do is because you've sinned. I think some of you, deep down, do believe that God isn't responding to you because you're such a failure, because you're such a poor Christian, because you're living such a poor Christian life. And so you try to explain to yourself why God isn't acting for me or for my loved ones or for the church. Why isn't God doing it? And they, right at the back of your mind is the thought, well, it's because I'm so awful. I'm such a terrible Christian. Well, here's the prophet then going through something very similar in Isaiah 64. And then when you come to verses 8 through to 12, do you see what he does? He moves from telling God why he shouldn't act to telling God why he should. So verse 8, but now, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are our potter. And so he begins to give God reasons why he should do this thing. You're our father. You love us as a father. And we are helpless clay. We can't do anything of ourselves. You have to shape us and mold us and make us. And it's, it's who you are as God. So for this reason then, why don't you act? And go down those verses and can you see that he then piles reason upon reason why God should do this very thing he's asking him to do. Take a look, oh God, he says. Look around you. See what Jerusalem looks like. Take a look at the temple where our fathers used to go to worship you. See what a mess it is. See how ruined everything is. How few we are. God, why don't you then do the things we're asking you to do? Because you can see the mess we're in. You can see the danger. You can see the destruction. You can see what will happen if you don't. And so the prophet gives God these reasons. Now, it's not difficult, is it? For you and I, as we keep in mind what we're asking God to do, to also think about the reasons we give him why he should. So if you're asking God to do something for you, what do you say to him? Why should he? What reasons do you give to God? why he should act for you. If you're praying for someone else, and let's imagine now we're praying for somebody in our family to become a Christian. What reasons do you give to God why he should save that person in your family? Do you say to God, but God, I love this person? Do you say to God, this person has a soul and we've heard about the value of the soul. We've heard that you can't give anything in exchange for a soul. So do you offer to God these reasons? Because that's what the prophet does. He offers reasons to God. Think of the church. Now, if I was to say to you, what am I asking God for? I'd be quite honest and say to you, I very rarely ask God to do anything for myself. But I do ask God to do things for the church. So this passage resonates with me. I think I'm the equivalent, the modern day equivalent. I say, God, look around at the church. Look at how few we are. Look at how old we are. Look at how weak we are. Look at how few people are, are saved these days. Why don't you, God? Do something for the church. Why don't you? And then there's moments when I think, well, it's because we've sinned. It's because we are all like a leaf gone with the wind. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. So this passage is one that speaks very clearly to me. Now, what I want you to notice is something that is easily missed in these verses. Look at verses 3 and four. And I'll read them to you again. 
when you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down. The mountains shook at your presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him. Now, can you see in those two verses, you've got the key which unlocks everything that's going on in this chapter. The prophet's asking God to do something. He's saying, God, don't do it because we are like this. And then he says, but God, do it because, because of these reasons. And then verses three and four solves what the prophet is experiencing. And I want to sum it up like this. What the prophet seems to grasp just for a moment in this chapter is that God is always working, but God has always worked where we are not looking. God works where no one expects. God works where no one asks. And God from the beginning is the God who works out of our gaze. Take a look again at verses three and four. When you did awesome things for which we did not look. So here's the prophet looking for God to rend the heavens and come down. But then into his mind comes the thought that God's characteristic feature is he works where we don't look. He works where we don't see. And he works where we don't expect. Turn back to the verse. You came down. Now, that's what he's asking him to do in verse 1. But then the prophet remembers, well, God has done this. He's done it. You came down. The mountain shook at your presence. Well, I'm asking him to do that. But, but he's done it before. And then here you are, verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, Men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, and so on. Now, this verse has been a torture to me over the last number of weeks. And it's tortured me because it seems so important that we get it right. And I'm not sure if I can get it right this morning. So I'm going to do my best, and let's see where we are led. What this prophet suddenly understands is this idea, then, that God works where we don't look, where there's no one to see. And so he goes back to creation itself. Take a look at verse 4. Since the beginning, this prophet goes back to creation. And he almost says to himself, now look, was there anybody at the time of creation who said, God, we think you should do creation. We think you should act and create the universe. Was there anyone there to ask such a thing? Was there anybody in the beginning who said to God, we think you should create, but, uh, but don't do it because we are such terrible sinners. Because all our righteousness is like filthy rags, oh God. So, so we think you should create, but don't do it because we are so awful. Was there anybody at the moment of creation who said, God, we think you should create the universe for these reasons? And so let's give you the reasons, oh God, why you should create, and then we can persuade you. Was there anybody asking God to do this great work of creation? And of course, the answer is no. There was no one. God worked, He made the heavens and the earth, He created our world. 
He made the dry land and the seas. He made the animals and he made man in his image. And there was nobody there saying, God, this is something you should do. Our God works because it pleases him to do so. He works according to his purpose. He works according to his plans. He works because he is the great and awesome God who does as he pleases. He does not work where we want or expect or look or wait. He works where we can't see, where there is no one to see. Now, our prophet catches a glimpse of that truth in these verses, three and four. And then sadly, what seems to happen is he's, he's had this moment of insight that here he is pleading with God to do something. And, and he sees that God doesn't need this because when creation was, he made all things freely by his own choice. So God doesn't need me to, to reason with him or to persuade him or to tell him why he shouldn't. The prophet sees this just for a moment. And then he loses sight of it. And so, as we've seen, he goes from verses 5 to 7 with his sins, 8 to 12, with his reasons. But there was that moment when he understood the sovereignty and the majesty and the glory of a God who works according to his own purposes. Now, it seems to me that this is so important for us in these days. It's a vision of what you can't see. And the Apostle Paul, I think, is intrigued by this idea. And so he takes it up in 1 Corinthians 2. So let's turn there. And as we turn to this passage now, as used by Paul in the hands of Paul, let's see if we can get a clearer sense of what Paul has come to understand. So here's the idea then. God works where we can't see, where we don't look, where we don't ask. God works where we don't pray. He works out of our vision and he works for his glory. Now let's look at what Paul does with that idea. First of all, I want you to see what he says in verses seven and eight. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. Had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And then there's the quote from Isaiah 64. What Paul does is this, it seems to me. Isaiah understands that creation was a great work of God with no one praying for it to happen. What Paul sees here is that the cross is an even greater word of work of God and no one was praying for it to happen. Nobody said to God, God, we think it's a really good idea for you to send your son and send him to the cross. What Paul is saying here is no one said to God, we think, God, you should save us by sending your son, but we are so terrible and such awful sinners that we don't think you should do it. Paul is saying no one said to God, send your son, O oh God, let him go to the cross and do it for these reasons. Do it for your glory. Nobody went to God and asked God, to send his son to the cross. No eye saw it, no ear heard it. It never came into the heart of, or the mind of man that God should do this. It occurred to no one to turn to God in prayer and say, God, we think you should send your son. No one. And so what Paul says on that Friday night, that day, Thursday night before, when Christ, the Lord of glory, was nailed to the cross, no eye was there seeing God at work. No ear, those ears that heard 
Jesus cry, my God, why have you forsaken me? None of those ears showed that God was working, that God was doing this greatest work of saving the souls of men by offering his son as a sacrifice. As that crowd stood there on that Friday, and there was the great religious festival about to happen in Jerusalem, no mind was there looking and seeing and understanding the great work that God was doing. So God does his great works God shows his wisdom and his power and his majesty and his glory according to his purpose, not in response to what we say or do. Do you get some sense of what's going on in these verses? So Isaiah saw creation and he saw that there was no voice raised to God saying, God, we think creation is a good idea. Paul takes that thought and he applies it to the cross and he says there was no voice raised to God to say, God, send your son to the cross. But God had planned this before the foundation of the world and he brought it about because of his love for men and women. There was no voice saying to God why he should do it, why he shouldn't do it. God worked because it pleases him. Now there's another idea in 1 Corinthians 2, can you see it? So you've got creation in Isaiah, you've got the cross here initially as Paul's first thought. And then you have in verse nine, just a hint that there is yet another work that God will do because it pleases him. And it's the work of the new creation, the new heavens, and the new earth. So God has already prepared, and no one can see it, it's beyond our eye, and no one has heard what it's like, because Paul who went there wasn't allowed to tell us, and no human mind can grasp what the glories of the new heaven and the new earth will be like, because it's beyond the human mind's ability to grasp. But God has prepared this new heaven and this new earth. So what Paul is saying here is nobody said to God, God, we think you should make a new heaven and a new earth. But hold on, don't do it because we're such terrible sinners. Or do it, God, because we think there's good reason why you should do it. Nobody went to God and said, God, why don't you wrap this old world up like a scroll, burn it all with fire, and bring in a new heaven and a new earth, and bring it in uh, with righteousness and glory, and give us a place in it so that we may sit there forever made in your image. Nobody said that to God. So no eye, no ear, no mind was able to conceive what God is doing. So the original creation was a pure act of God. The cross was a work of God beyond the sight and the understanding of human beings. And there is still to come this new heaven and new earth, the Father's house, with many mansions, prepared by God himself as a, 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 a response from God to those who love him. Now, this great work of God is yet a mystery. It's yet a secret. It's yet still hidden from us, but we know. And uh, if you were to go back to Isaiah 64 and just carry on a chapter into chapter 65, and I think Paul must have understood this, there's a, a chapter there about the new heavens and the new earth. So this idea of a new work, a future work, a work that no one has asked for, was found in Isaiah and is just hinted at here by the Apostle Paul. Now, I'm going to stop for a moment and, and just ask you, are you still with me? Because I think this is a hugely important vision. But I think I know some of you well enough to know that right now, maybe, even right now, you're thinking about what you're hearing 
and you're starting to raise doubts and questions. So let me recap what I'm saying. We're asking God, aren't we, to do something. You've been asking God to do something. And what the prophet sees, and what Paul sees, is this vision of God. That we have a God who is so great, so majestic, that he works according to his purposes. He works for his glory. He works as a sovereign God. He does as he chooses from the beginning. And so what Isaiah and Paul just glimpse at is the greatest encouragement to keep asking God to work. Now, do you see that? If you don't see it, you've missed the entire point of this vision. So I'm going to imagine some of you now are thinking like this, oh, well, okay, Neil, if God created and no one asked him, if God did the cross and no one asked him, and if, if, God, if God is going to do the new heavens and the new, new earth and nobody's asking him, well, well, perhaps I shouldn't ask him then. Perhaps I shouldn't go to him then and, and ask him to do things then because, because God is the God who works when I don't look and he works when I don't see and he works out of sight and he works in this way. Perhaps I shouldn't be asking him then. I was one of those preachers who'd say, hands up, all those of you who are thinking like that. I'm sure some of you would put your hands up. That's the wrong thing to take from this vision. And why is it the wrong thing to take? Come back to 1 Corinthians 2 and look again at verses 8, 9, 10, and so on. Look at Paul's use of this verse from Isaiah 64. I'll start with verse 9. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So here is a love context and then verse 10 god has revealed them to us and so what he says to you is that isaiah himself you and i we're in this privileged position where god has already told us that he works where you don't look that he works where you don't expect that he works where you can't see, that he doesn't need any of us to give him a prod or to make a suggestion or to persuade him to do things or to tell him why he shouldn't because of our sins. God doesn't require this from us. What God has shown us, what he's revealed to us, what the Spirit of God has made clear to the people of God is that we have a God who loves us and a God who has already, this word prepared, he has already worked for his glory. And so here's the encouragement. Like the prophet, we're asking God to do something. Any sign of it yet? Any sense at all that God is doing it? Week after week after week we go, don't we? Let me use my example. I'm asking God for the church. Any sign that things are getting any better? Those of you who are asking for loved ones, any sign at all that God is doing anything? When did you try to persuade him last? When did you say to him last, oh God, you know, you're still not doing it, are you? It must be because of our sins. When did you last speak to him like that? Now, here's the vision to take from this morning. You have a God who has already, for his own glory, prepared everything. He has already worked everything out. He already holds in his hands who you are. He already holds your loved ones. He already holds the church. 
He already has this world in his hands. He's already working everything out as exactly as it ought to be. Everything is exactly where God wants it to be. And so God is saying to you, he has already told you who he is as God, what he is like. He's already told you that he loves you. And he has already told you that he works where you can't see. So here's the killer line from this verse. As you ask God to do this thing you're asking him to do, you don't judge. You don't come to conclusions based on what you can or can't see. Based on whatever thought comes into your mind, you do not, as you wait for God, look with these eyes and say there's no sign of it. You don't listen with our ears and say, I hear no evidence of it. And you certainly don't, in your mind, allow thoughts to come in which convince you that God isn't and will not and never can do what you're asking him to do. It's about judgment. We don't make judgments about what we ask God to do. Remember how the verse goes? I hasn't seen. You haven't seen. You cannot see how God is responding, how God is working. You cannot see what God is doing. So stop looking, because God will work where you can't see. It doesn't mean he's not going to work. It means he's working where you can't see. It's out of your vision. And in the same way, stop listening for some evidence that he's doing what you've asked, because the ear cannot hear what God is doing. And for me, the most important bit is nor has it entered into the heart of man. What are your thoughts? Your thoughts now about what you've asked God to do. What are you thinking? Are you thinking that it's been a long time? Are you thinking that it's too late? Are you thinking? What are you thinking? Now you see what the prophet understands, what Paul understands based on creation, on the cross, on the new creation, based on these fundamental purposes of God, what these two men see is this. We don't wait to see, we don't wait to hear, and our thoughts, our thoughts do not play a part in how God responds. It's outside of your thoughts, it's outside of your sight, it's outside of your hearing. God works there. And so what you've been told about God is to go on hoping in a God who works outside of your sight, outside of your hearing, and outside of your understanding. Hold on to such a God because this is who God is and this is how he has always worked. And he has prepared his works. And he is the God who is your father, the God who loves. So we have this vision, this vision of God, whom we are asking to do things. And this vision is a vision of what our eye can't see, what our ear can't hear, what our thoughts can't hold. But we hold nonetheless to this vision of a God who works, and who always works, and who works for his glory. Well, let's pray together. It's lovely to see some of our